This is American government. Um, Wednesday, November 11th, every Veterans Day. Um, and what we'll be discussing today is the, um, the basis of the development and the, the uh, structure of the federal judiciary. Um, and in our next lecture, we'll um, consider the great controversy over the nature of judicial review today and the role of the courts in our society and constitutional system. Um, so let's talk about um, the constitutional foundations and the basis of the judicial system a little bit, and then we'll talk about its development and how it operates today. And then we'll uh, consider some critical concepts from both Chapter 11 and in general um, to understand aspects of our judicial system and how judicial power works out in practice. Um, our, our judiciary, uh, is sometimes called the common law judiciary. I've mentioned that term a few times. And it's because um, essentially our judicial system uh, grew out of and is a development of the British common law judicial system as opposed to the continental system, the form of justice that typically operates in most European countries. Um, the difference between the British system and the Continental system, among other things, is the British system tends to be adversarial, where two contesting parties, whether it's the defense, prosecution and defense, or plaintiff and defendant, uh, operate and typically represented by contrasting attorneys as different interests, with the judge presiding as an umpire over the, the clash between these adversaries. In the continent, which follows the Roman model more, um, uh, the judge often is uh, is the investigator and conducts the trial, not only conducts the trial in terms of umpire, but oftentimes um, uh, performs the function of, of in inquiry on both sides. So, um, but in many ways, it's the structure and procedures of the British judiciary that we have uh, adopted as our own. So what I'd like to do is explain a little bit about what the term common law means and how it came to describe the British system and how it is the foundation for what, the way our system operates with, under the Constitution. Um, the British common law system goes back to about 1170 with Henry II, who started the British uh, court system. And uh, his concern was that, uh, since in the British uh, system at that time at least, um, the, the crown, the king, queen, crown, is still, strictly speaking, the sovereign of the nation, although Britain, Britain has become a modern democracy like other democracy, modern democracies. But um, in that system, just like in King Solomon in the Bible, uh, the king would be the ultimate result for conflicts and criminal cases brought on appeal. And uh, Henry noted that there were so many different ways of resolving cases all around the country, so he wanted to bring some uniformity into the British system. So. The first sense of which common means common law is the system created in order to generate the common law for the entire nation. In that sense, it's a structural issue because Henry then started by creating local courts, which would be rooted, as we'll come back to this in a minute, rooted in the local customs and standards of the people, and judges would judge according to that. But then there'd be a, so district courts, and you'll see that's what our lowest courts are also called in our system. And then there'd be a middle level of more comprehensive geographical areas that would incorporate several districts, the appellate structure, the middle layer. Um, and in our system, we have that too. We have appellate courts. They're sometimes in our constitutional system called uh, circuit courts, for reasons I'll explain. And then at the top would be the king, uh, who would then hear cases on appeal. And that pyramidical structure would eventually sift out all the different standards and cases that judges had evolved. And because they culminated in national unity at the top, um, eventually it would, it would standardize. So in one level, it's called the common law system because it created a common law uh, judge-made uh, um, uh, system for the entire nation. The other sense in which it mean common law meant was the initial standards of the judges in trials on the local level would be the, the local common customs of the people. So the common law originated sort of like in a, the judge's embrace of how local customary standards work. Common means that. And so 
as you'll see, there's, uh, there's one other aspect to this, and this is important, to, and we'll, we'll discuss this separately, but one of the other features that the common law system developed was um, precedent, where on the level, the same level of authority of a court, a subsequent court would be bound by and have to rule according to the preceding decisions of the court on that same level of authority. Now, again, in a hierarchical system, the higher court trumps the lower courts, but in on the same level of authority, say, as the district courts, or uh, in a particular area where a court would have the same level of authority as one that preceded it in time, the, the, the one that preceded in time would have a kind of a binding authority. That doctrine of precedent is called stare decisis. That's how it's mispronounced in English. Let the decision stand. Now, as you'll see, when we come back to this in our system, we have that in our system too, and that's an important aspect of the way judges function and rule. Um, but in the British system, precedent is understood to be absolute. In the American system, precedent is binding, but the judges, especially of the Supreme Court, are not understood to be absolutely bound by it. It is a guide or a rule rather than a fixed um, uh, legal principle. No, I, I just misspoke myself. Um, it's a guide rather than a straitjacket. Although British courts are also very flexible in how they actually modify precedents. So over time, because of precedent and because of the pyramidal structure and because of the common origins of the standards, that's why the British system is called common law. And we essentially uh, uh, inherited that, of course, because we were British colonies and that's the way the courts operated in the colonies. And as I mentioned, during the Constitutional Convention, they didn't discuss the judiciary very much because they pretty much understood that they were going to take that structure over into the constitutional system, and that's what they did, and that's how our courts have grown. Um, and uh, um, I would say one other thing is, is one interesting question, of course, and this was, a, this was a, a controversy that surfaced several times in the emergence of the British common law system, and that was, could the judge-made common law be used to restrain or restrict the sovereign? Now, of course, it's problematic because if the king is the head of the judiciary, now that's not the way the British Constitution operates today, but if the king was the head of the judiciary, obviously judge-made laws, the judges are extensions of the king or crown, and therefore you couldn't create judge-made law to limit the power of the crown. Um, and in the British um, uh, Constitution, when during the British Civil War in the 1600s, when authority really shifted the, from the crown to the parliament, now don't get me wrong, the crown is still technically sovereign, but it's really, the British system moved to a kind of parliamentary uh, supremacy. And the question arose, could the courts declare a law of parliament uh, unconstitutional? And that's fuzzy. It's, changed somewhat recently in the in the British Constitution, but the answer to that was no. And the British House of Lords, by the way, functioned as the kind of Supreme Court. But the main reason was, since Britain doesn't have a written constitution, there's no standard exterior to the law of Parliament, um, which actually shapes the Constitution. As you're going to see, what makes all the difference in the world in our constitutional system is the presence of the written Constitution. And that provided the argument for judicial review that we saw in our previous discussions. So um, that's the British common law system. Uh, let me say one other thing, that many of the procedures and judicial instructions and documents that Britain evolved also made their way into our system. The writ system, like a writ of warrant or a writ of habeas corpus or a writ of injunction or a writ of prohibition or a writ of mandamus as we saw. So, Let's uh, briefly look at the constitutional basis of authority in Article 3 and Article 6. We've already somewhat examined these, especially when we looked at um, uh, Chief Justice Marshall's um, uh, construction of his case for judicial review in Marbury v. Madison. Um, let's just look at the Constitution in Article 3 and see how some issues arise and how they work out in our system. You had to see that I had to put my homemade bifocals on. Um, so, Article 3, Section 1, the Vesting Clause and Subsequent Structural Considerations. The judicial power of the United States 
shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress shall may from time to time ordain and establish. So uh, that's the first, again, like the other vesting clauses, you get both the essential grant of power, and then you'll see how that's elaborated and how that in critical aspects of judicial power are uh, uh, further elaborated in section two. Isn't we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but you hear, you hear, you see the pyramidical structure of the British common law judiciary constitutionally embraced uh, in one supreme court and such inferior courts as Congress shall from time to time establish. So you don't actually necessarily have the three layer. Uh, 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 court system already established by that clause, but it's clear that you're going to have something like um, a pyramidical or hi hierarchical structure with one Supreme Court at the top. And again, once they actually fleshed out the court system in the uh, Judiciary Act of 1789, which I've already referred to because that's partially what um, uh, Marshall declared unconstitutional in Marbury v. Madison, um, they very quickly adopted the tri-layer system local district courts essentially where most trials would take place the second middle layer of um, uh, uh, appellate courts where where the the cases are appealed from the local original courts upwards usually on matters of legal interpretation and standards and then um, with the the supreme institution at the top um, so uh, note to article Three, section one goes on to supply some other structural information, some of what we've already discussed. When we discussed Federal 78 by Hamilton, um, the judges, both of the Supreme Court and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall, at stated times, receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So, uh, as we've already seen, Hamilton defends the unusual distinction that the judges hold their office for life or for good behavior. They can be impeached, of course, and of the 15 successful impeachments that the House have initiated and that have gone to the Senate successfully, uh, they have three of them have been presidents, as you know, but the rest have been federal judges for different reasons like drunkenness, insanity, incompetence, corruption, bribery. Um, so. The other salary provision that's mentioned here is, is in the same way the executive branch. Congress sets the president's salary. Congress sets the judge's salary. One difference is in Article 2, the president's salary cannot be raised or lowered during his time in office so that the Congress can neither bribe nor uh, um, compel through either raising or lowering salary. Here, the judge's salary can be raised during the term. Of course, that has to do with their lifelong term. If you're in office for many years, then obviously the value of money can change and, and et cetera. So the judge's salaries can be raised, but they cannot be lowered uh, during their time in office. Um, and so uh, Article uh, 3, Section 2. Uh, let's just briefly discuss the three sections in Article 2. Uh, section 2 then goes on to put important definitions of the judicial power and stipulate kinds of jurisdiction. Um, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and treaties made or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors, and etc. And then um, in the sec second part of, uh, claw uh, of Section 2, uh, the distinction between original appellate jurisdiction is made, and we'll come back to that later, and you should be very familiar with that from Marbury v. Madison. So uh, Article 3, Section 3, oh, the last part of Article 3, Section 2, then, has to do with the requirement of trials by jury in trials, in, in, in original trials. And Article 3, Section 3 defines what is permissible and kinds of punishments of treason. So that's the, the sketch of Article 3, and we'll discuss some of these issues I discussed a minute ago. Article 6, which you're already familiar with, of course, is the Supremacy Clause. And the reason we're discussing that with the judiciary is exactly the same reason that, that Marshall mentioned it in Marbury v. Madison. Um, Article 6 declares the Constitution and the laws of the United States and all treaties of the United States to be the supreme law of the land, and anything in any state law or constitution contrary shall be null and void. And the judges in every state shall 
make that distinction. So uh, this is something we saw going back to the Constitutional Convention. This is the primary, it's through the courts. Uh, if you remember my, again, as I've mentioned, my fantastic um, uh, uh, um, equation uh, summing up the Constitution, the JR un, uh, un, underneath the denominator, uh, in the denominator, means judicial review. And of course, the other aspect of Article 6 that determines the judges is that the judges, as do all federal, in fact, all state and all local uh, public officials on the United States have to take an oath to support the Constitution. That has consequences for, if you remember, the argument that, Marbury, that Marshall makes in Marbury v. Madison. So uh, let's discuss the way that the structure of the fair courts has been built. And, um, and essentially, there's two very good charts um, uh, on page um, uh, 249 and 253 of the Wilson chapter. Uh, it would be nice if they did a little more pyramidically or, or, or uh, hierarchically, but their, their design is clear enough. And so the essential structure of the federal jury is that three-tiered uh, local district courts where most of the trials occur, the middle level of appellate courts, which are sometimes called circuit courts, because originally j judges on the Supreme Court would only sit for a small time on the Supreme Court. And what they would be doing during the rest of the time is writing circuit presiding over the various appellate courts. And as the Wilson point, text points out, there are about 94 district courts, on average, uh, one for each state. But of course, some states are very big with huge populations, others are not. And some district courts encompass more than one state, like the Fourth Circuit occur, includes both South Carolina and North Carolina and parts of Virginia. Um, so there are about 94 local courts, district courts, there are about 11 and if you add the District of Columbia and, uh, and one other circuit court, there are 13 courts of appeal, appellate courts or circuit courts, and then one Supreme Court at the top. Now, if you look at the chart on page 253, you'll see there are also di different kinds of courts. There's a military courts and, and commercial courts that also feed up into the Supreme Court system. But the primary one is from what are called the constitutional courts in Article 3. The judges who, who are appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate and, um, uh, and who serve during good behavior. The um, uh, other source of court cases for the Supreme Court is, of course, the state courts. And here, the states basically embodied uh, the same uh, kinds of, the, the same kind of uh, three-layered um, system that the British common law system encouraged. And here's what you have to remember that the state court system, the state courses, court systems in the United States are independent court systems. Remember the states have semi-sovereignty uh, and therefore their court systems that interpret state laws and issues uh, are completely independent of the federal judiciary. And the only time that a state case can move it to the federal judiciary is sometimes for certain kinds of uh, financial amounts. But generally speaking, the federal courts have no authority over state court cases unless a state court makes an interpretation or decides a case in which the federal constitution, our constitution, a national law, or uh, a national treaty is involved with part of the state uh, uh, court. And basically, the vast bulk of state cases never make it up to the Supreme Court, uh, although sometimes they do, like McCulloch v. Maryland, we saw that. Um, but in, in essence, the state court systems, uh, to repeat one more time, are, are really quite independent. And the federal courts and the Supreme Court has no power over a state court unless a federal question is involved of interpreting uh, where the, consti the federal constitution. Now, I, I have to say that the primary, uh, there were relatively few state cases that ever made it to the Supreme Court prior to the passage of the 14th Amendment. And as we'll see when we talk in the chapters about civil rights and liberties, it's the 14th Amendment uh, that has been the most active source of state cases being reviewed by the Supreme Court for reasons that we'll see in a couple of lectures. Um, the other thing to note is that uh, generally speaking, most of the state courts do follow the federal model, which is to say appointment by the executive 
with the state senate or state legislature, the upper house of the state legislature ratifying the appointment and serving for good behavior. But since the turn of the century in the progressive movement, where there was an attempt to create more popular um, input into offices such as referenda and recall provisions for elected officials, and as I already mentioned in our party system discussion, the primary election, that is to say for nominating purposes in the primary, one of the other popular popularizing features of the progressive movement was to have judges either be elected or, if appointed by the governor with the Senate, the state Senate, uh, to have them be re-elected. And North Carolina is like that, and um, I believe certain parts of the South Carolina judiciary are, and the Illinois judiciary is like that too. So uh, I think in about 15 states, judges are appointed by the governor uh, with the consent, uh, advice and consent of the state Senate, but they often serve in a set term. And then, for instance, it just so happened in the Illinois um, Supreme Court, uh, the Supreme Court justice uh, was not renewed by election. Uh, Illinois Constitution requires, after a set term of years, the Supreme Court, the justices of the Supreme Court have to be elected by 60% of uh, um, the electorate or else they will they are turned out. So they have a limited term, in other words and they are re-elected. Now this is very difficult in many states because um, as we saw with the party system, party affiliation often provides an important cue for voters and in many states that have judicial election or re-election, uh, they are forced to be by their constitutions nonpartisan, which is to say, uh, and those of you from North Carolina who voted in North Carolina know, it's almost impossible to know anything about these judges since they're not allowed to have partisan identification. But that's the way the state court systems operate. And I should also say that many states have, although they follow this traditional hierarchical system, many states, to reduce the burden of the state Supreme Court, will have a subordinate state court of appeals, which then kind of operates as where most of the cases are appealed up and then filtered by that, and some go up to the Supreme Court. Uh, South Carolina has both a Supreme Court and a court of appeals. So... Um, one other thing about the structure of the federal judiciary um, is, of course, uh, the question of the size of the Supreme Court. And the Constitution does not set the size of the Supreme Court. Uh, it started out with seven, and during then it went up to nine, and during the Civil War there were 11 justices. But since the end of the Civil War, constitutional custom has set the, the number of the court at nine for obvious reasons. It's small enough to be deliberative, yet it's an odd number, so it, ties are less frequently as one of the judges is missing through death, as it happened with the, Justice Ginsburg, um, or if a judge recuses him or herself, that is to say because of a conflict of interest or a special relationship with the parties involved in the case, uh, they will not sit because of the that may undermine their impartiality of a, as a judge. Um, now, uh, Wilson discusses the most controversial court packing scheme, which was in 1936-1937, uh, when the Supreme Court, after President Roosevelt, FDR, was elected in 32 and re-elected in 36, um, that um, uh, many parts of the New Deal were held, and we'll, we'll discuss this somewhat in our next lecture about the judicial philosophy and orientation and the understanding of constitutional orientation in the Supreme Court. But um, uh, initially, the Supreme Court, uh, the majority of the justices on the Supreme Court, held almost all the major programs in the New Deal and the legislation of the New Deal to be unconstitutional. Uh, Roosevelt, after his second election, was frustrated by this uh, and, um, and suggested packing the court by pr pr proposing a retirement age, um, and also raising the level, the number of the justices on the court to 15 so that he could have more of the justices who voted to support his New Deal programs. Even though Roosevelt, who was a popular president, elected four times and had massive support in Congress and majorities, nevertheless, this tampering for political purposes with the size of the court was very unpopular and he withdrew it and the court changed its orientation on these questions anyway, as is described in the Wilson text. That became a controversy this year during the presidential election when, when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, uh, President uh, Trump 
uh, nominated and the, the Republican Senate uh, um, ratified the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett to the court, who was just sworn in. And, um, and some angry Democrats were threatening if, Biden, if President, Vice President Biden won the presidential election uh, to expand the number of court the, and to do this court packing thing. But, but this is still pretty controversial. We'll see what happens. So uh, let's just uh, conclude then with a consideration of some major uh, concepts and references in the Wilson text and major concepts that you really need to understand to understand the way our courts function and some of the controversies in them. Um, the first one is ju jurisdiction. Now, we've already encountered this. Um, uh, uh, there are different kinds of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction means the legal right of a court to decide a case. Uh, and, and as I mentioned in our discussion of uh, Marbury v. Madison, um, the, and in our discussion of the structural basis of the federal judiciary, the most common uh, 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 the most common form of jurisdiction is jurisdiction by geography. Each of the lowest courts in the system, the district courts, cover a locality. And, and of course, this also this sets the limits of state court jurisdiction, too. The state boundaries do. And, and so there are county courts and also municipal courts in every state, too. And, um, and, and so, uh, generally speaking, district courts, the lowest courts, have the smallest geographical unit with circuit courts or appellate courts encompassing several districts so that they are appealed upwards. And, um, but there are also two other kinds of jurisdiction. One is by party and one is by issue. Article 3, Section 2 um, uh, uh, de decides the original or the jurisdiction of the federal courts by party, essentially. Two states, an ambassador, public official, the United States citizens of two states, um, and then talks, then as we saw in Marbury v. Madison, when it comes to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, uh, makes a distinction between original jurisdiction, those cases that can originate uh, in the Supreme Court as a trial court, and appellate jurisdiction, those cases that can only come up to the Supreme Court once the trial is started in a lower court and are appealed up. Um, the... Um, the other kind of jurisdiction is jurisdiction by issue. Uh, for instance, Article 3, Section 2 starts, starts out by saying, uh, um, the judicial power of the federal courts shall extend to all uh, cases arising under this Constitution, the laws of the United States, and, uh, and, um, and the treaties of the United States. So there, if there's a case that involves the issue of interpretation of either the Constitution a, a national law or a treaty, that's the kind of issue that generates jurisdiction. And if you look at the structure of the federal judiciary, like military courts obviously have um, uh, jurisdiction over military cases, and each of the armed services has their own internal uh, judicial structure. Um, um, so um, um, the other uh, issue with respect to uh, jurisdiction is um, um, is who defines it. And of course, uh, the courts, the Supreme Court's original jurisdiction is set by the Constitution, those parties that are mentioned in Article 3, Section 2. And, and then it says, uh, and then Congress essentially structures the court's appellate jurisdiction. It determines which cases can be, with such exemptions, it says, and, and, and as Congress shall from time to time, uh, established. So not only does the Congress create the lower court system, it also determines how cases are appealed up. And, and there is some controversy uh, because when the court has often made unpopular decisions, there has been sometimes a popular threat to prevent certain cases from coming up to it, although they're generally not successful. Although the court did this in the, Supreme, in the Civil War, that's true. Um, and uh, but generally speaking, it's important to remember that Congress has, it's understood to have pretty full power over the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction. Um, the second concept I'm going to talk about is, I've already mentioned this, is stare decisis, because that became, uh, people have become sort of aware of that during Supreme Court justice nominations. Um, 
Remember, this is part of the British judicial system, the British common law system, that a court on that level of authority of a prior court uh, uh, generally follows the decisions and rulings of the earlier court. Now, uh, again, in the British system, that's generally held to be an absolute principle, but because we have a written constitution that judges have access to, um, to interpret, stare decisis or precedent is a much more flexible. Generally speaking, the courts in our system do follow precedent, and the Supreme Court will follow precedents uh, set by earlier courts uh, unless they find a good reason or change their mind. Uh, how, why is that controversial? Well, in 1896, um, the Supreme Court held that segregated facilities were constitutional, even though the Equal Protection Clause says um, uh, no state shall deny equal protection because it says you can have se separate facilities if they're equal, and that came to be known as the Separate But Equal Doctrine. But in Brown v. Board of Education, the court set that precedent aside. Controversially, of course, um, the issue became uh, came up in, in the three justices nominated by President Trump, uh, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, and especially Justice um, Barrett, because uh, the question of the status of Roe v. Wade from 1973 has been, a, well, the courts probably, one of, besides Dred Scott in 1857, has been one of the court's most controversial decisions. And, and the, when we talk about liberal versus conservative, ideology on the court, etc. Um, many political conservatives um, believe that uh, Roe v. Wade was improperly decided, and many abortion opponents uh, uh, seek judges who, and that's, there's a nice discussion in the Wilson chapter about litmus test, litmus test. Generally speaking, we try to avoid that, and we try to uh, confine um, uh, judicial, uh, the ratification of, of presidential judicial nominations based on qualification. But since the 1980s, um, the idea of a litmus test and, and, and the ideological uh, or ph philosophic orientation of the judge has now become almost a standard feature of judicial nominations, and we'll examine more of that in our next lecture. Um, the concept of standing is important. Uh, and Wilson has a good discussion of it. And here's where the concept derives from. Article 3, Section 2 says, the judicial power shall um, extend to all cases arising under this Constitution. And therefore, this is why the judges conclude that judicial power cannot be exercised, and Hamilton makes a point of this in Federalist 78, that judicial power cannot be exercised independently or actively by the courts, the courts can only use their grant or employ or activate uh, their grant of judicial power if um, uh, uh, other parties bring a case to it. And so the doctrine of standing arose as an attempt to describe when you have a case. Since judicial power can't be activated at will by the court, but only when a case is in front of it, the doctrine of standing, standing uh, developed so as to let you know when you had a case. When do you have a case? Generally speaking, the doctrine of standing says there has to be a genuine controversy. There has to be real two parties who have truly adverse interests. That means one of them has to win and one of them has to lose. More importantly, the doctrine of standing says that the only people who can bring cases uh, before the judiciary and certainly before the Supreme Court, that each party has to have an actual stake in it, an actual possibility of being harmed by the outcome of the case. Um, and the Wilson text goes on to discuss, for instance, the question of taxpayer standing. Uh, earlier in the 20th century, the court held that taxpayers as taxpayers don't have standing to bring suit in federal court. In 1921, I believe, or the 1921 Maternity Act had laid a small tax uh, on on um, individuals uh, to be diverted to provide milk for mothers for indigent poor mothers, and the court decided. And in Frothingham v. Mellon, um, Mrs. Frothingham from Massachusetts decided that to take her her tax money and give it to another mother who needed milk was actually depriving her of her property without due process of law, and the court rejected her suit on the grounds that. 
the actual amount of harm that when you take the number of taxpayers in the United States and the amount of money, the amount of money that in this program that was raised and spent, that it would be like one thousandth of a cent uh, that Mrs. Frothingham, the party who brought the case, and so the case was dismissed because the argument was she really wouldn't didn't stand to be harmed. She might not have liked the law, and she might have, but if she didn't like the law, this the solution wasn't to take to create a court case, which because of her trivial amount of financial interest. And the court has modified this doctrine, but generally speaking, is true. So it's still a, an important concept. Uh, the Wilson case, uh, the Wilson uh, textbook points out that the Congress has often expanded standing. So, for instance, environmental groups have standing under certain environmental laws to bring suit on behalf of trees or, or frogs or etc. endangered species. But generally speaking, this is still good doctrine. You can't bring a suit before the Supreme Court or the federal judiciary unless you can show that there's a true conflict of interest between you and the party, your adversary party, and that you have uh, you stand to be benefited or harmed in a substantial way. Um, so, uh, as as the Wilson text describes, uh, the Supreme Court sits on top of this vast federal structure with thousands and thousands of cases. So how does a case come up to the Supreme Court? Some cases are automatically appealed, like death penalty cases automatically are appealed up to the Supreme Court. Um, and it discusses uh, one form of getting us a, um, a, a case up to the Supreme Court is in form of pauperis, in, in the matter or in the form of a pauper, and refers to uh, Gideon v. Wainwright in the 1960s, where uh, uh, Gideon was an indigent, a poor prisoner who it turns out, by the way, really was framed and ha had did not have an attorney and was sent to prison. And in prison, he learned about how to appeal the case and that he formed out an inform he filled out an informal or pauperous uh, application like with rough pencil and went all the way to court. And by the way, that's where the court decided in that case that uh, anybody in a substantial criminal case has to have an attorney appointed by the court. Um, now, the most typical way that a case comes up to the Supreme Court is when four of the justices authorize a writ of certiorari, a writ of certiorari, which means essentially we certify or it is to be certified. And essentially that gives broad discretion to the Supreme Court to take the cases that they're interested in. It's also a way of the court controlling or managing its workload. Uh, Today, anywhere between 50 and 80 cases on average, 70 on average cases actually make it up to the Supreme Court. During the 1980s and 90s, the workload of the court had gotten to sometimes as many as uh, 200 to 300 cases a year, which is they just found that to be unmanageable. And even though they're, they're, uh, um, they're legal interns, actually the ones who clerk for the courts, uh, um, tend to write a good portion of the judges' opinions. They still do this in conference. They discuss their opinions and vote. Um, um, the, um, uh, the clerks actually do a good deal of writing. Nobody in politics today writes their own stuff pretty much. Certainly uh, every major politician and the major heads of the executive departments and bureaucrats all have professional speech writers who draft their speeches and write their writings for them, even if they touch them up at the end. That's not quite, that's something of an exaggeration when it comes to the justices of the Supreme Court, but um, uh, nevertheless, so, so a writ of certiorari is essentially how judge, the judges on the court accept to certify and to hear a case. So um, when a case comes to the Supreme Court, essentially the nine justices have uh, uh, four options. Sometimes uh, uh, the court is unanimous. Uh, and, and to stress that unanimity, the court will often only write one opinion and rather have it rather than have it speak in the name of any one of the justices, they'll write a per curiam for the court opinion in which everyone joins in. And that kind of, like for instance, Brown v. Board of Education was um, uh, a unanimous opinion. Uh, and, and therefore the court was speaking entirely in one voice. So you can join in a per curiam opinion. Beyond that, there's typically, uh, and if it, a decision isn't unanimous, that means there's going to be some disagreement on the court. And essentially, a, justices, a justice has three options on the Supreme Court. 
um, you can join in the majority opinion. And, and, and typically you'll see when justice, when uh, decisions are handed down, one of the justices is, is appointed to, the chief justice makes that, that decision, by the way, appoints one of the justices to write the majority opinion. And then the other justices have the option, if they agree with the decision, by the way, to join in the majority opinion. If a judge agrees with the outcome or decision of the course, but not the constitutional reasoning for the decision, then uh, the justice may write a concurring opinion. That means he agrees with the outcome and decision of the court again, but doesn't agree with the court's reasoning in, in that case. And if a judge disagrees with the outcome and the reasoning, the judge can file a dissenting opinion, which means he didn't agree with the court's outcome or decision and, and took exception to the court's reasoning too. Um, the last major concept I'm going to discuss is the concept of class action suits. Generally speaking, the parties in a case represent themselves. But especially since the end of World War II, the idea of a plaintiff joining with sometimes dozens, if not hundreds, or even millions of other plaintiffs, the ones who bring a case or initiate a suit, who share the same interest, has grown for both. And, and I'd have to say that that's, there's controversy about this practice. And there are benefits and liabilities. The benefit is is uh, uh, you can uh, uh, plaintiffs can actually uh, pool together and get the financial resources, especially like to sue big companies. So class action suits, especially if a company practice or um, ha has um, affected millions of people, of course, you could say. Uh, it's the, the parties who would bring a suit aren't just representing themselves, but represented everybody injured in that class. So that's one of the advantages. And you could say it's a counterweight to oftentimes the power of big corporations and everything. It, it kind of is an e equalizer. The downside of this is that if you start legislating for millions of people, then perhaps you're actually really turning yourself into an unelected legislature, making public policy based upon class action suits. So uh, there's both an upside and a downside to this, but generally speaking, this has become a more important part of our law. In our next lecture, then, we'll discuss um, the great question of the scope and nature uh, of judicial review. And those difference, great differences of opinion called judicial philosophy or ideology about how the justices in the judiciary and especially on the federal court use this remarkable power to declare the actions of the other branches of the states unconstitutional.